Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Chandel Hoover, APA Science Programs Officer. Please let us know where you're from by saying hello in the chat. This program is part of an APA series called Essential Science Conversations, where panelists and audience members can engage in an open dialogue about emerging topics in psychological science. Before we get started, I want to share a few quick announcements. First, thanks to those of you who submitted questions for today's program when you registered. We'll try to get to as many of those questions as possible. You can also ask a question as the program is taking place in real time. There's a Q&A feature on the dashboard Please enter your questions there. We'll be monitoring those throughout the program. Also, this program is being recorded. So once it ends, everyone who registers will receive an email with the link to the recording. You should receive that email in about two weeks time after the webinar concludes. Without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Mitch Princeton, APA's Chief Science Officer. Hello, and thank you for joining. Today, we're excited to talk about how our science can affect policy, how our work can provide the essential knowledge that lawmakers need to establish priorities, improve decision making, resolve policy differences, and how we can make it get more funding for psychological science. I'm very excited to introduce our panelists who will talk about how they have engaged in advocacy work and offer ways that you could be getting involved. I'm pleased to introduce each of these panelists now. First, Catherine McGuire is APA's first Chief Science Advocacy Officer, responsible for implementing a unified strategic vision for the association's government relations efforts and coordinating APA's broader advocacy initiatives in non-governmental sectors. With more than 25 years of senior level policy experience in Congress, the executive branch and the private sector, McGuire is most recently Assistant Secretary for Congressional and Intergovernmental Affairs at the U.S. Department of Labor. She has held senior management positions in the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate and worked as VP for Government Affairs at the Business Software Alliance, a trade group comprising the world's leading software companies, including Apple and Microsoft. Also so excited that we have Dr. Reggie Gazes and Associate Professor of Psychology and Animal Behavior at Bucknell University. Reggie earned her PhD at Emory University, then completed a postdoctoral fellowship in the primate research at Zoo Atlanta. She currently directs the Bucknell Primate Research Facility. Her research primarily focuses on social behavior and the evolution of cognition in non-human primates. She's been engaging in advocacy through APA as a member of the Committee on Animal Research and Ethics and the Comparative Cognition Society's representative to STAR, which is spreading truth about animal research. Very excited to introduce Erin Caseda, who is a fifth year doctoral student in clinical psychology at Rosalind Franklin University in Chicago, Illinois, where she's completing a dual specialization in neuropsych and health psychology. Erin's clinical and research interests include cognition in the context of pa uh, pediatric mental illness, neuropsychological and biomarkers of cancer-related cognitive impairment and medical trauma. She's passionate about translating research into actionable policy change and strongly believes that advocacy is a key professional competency for psychologists. Erin currently serves as the chair of the APAG's advocacy coordinating team and previously served as the chair and cognitive science representative to the APA Science Student Council. In addition to her advocacy work through APA, Erin is also involved in federal policy advocacy through the National Brain Tumor Society. And last but certainly not least, very excited to introduce Dr. William Stoops, a professor in the Department of Behavioral Science, Psychiatry, and Psychology at the University of Kentucky. Bill earned his bachelor's in psychology from Davidson College in Davidson, North Carolina, and his master's degree and PhD in psychology from the University of Kentucky. His research evaluates the behavioral and pharmacological factors that contribute to drug use disorders, focusing primarily on stimulant drugs. He is the immediate past president of the College on Problems of Drug Dependence and is editor of Experimental and Clinical Psychopharmacology. He's also a member of the APA Advocacy Coordinating Committee and is a strong advocate for psychological science, providing specific guidance to APA on the role of psychology and psychologists in addressing the addiction epidemic. He has considerable experience interacting with policymakers locally and nationally to advocate for research and to incorporate research priorities into pending legislation. Welcome to all of our panel panelists. 
and let's have an essential science conversation. Thank you so much. Your intros are incredibly impressive, also a little long. I'm afraid we're out of time for today. No, we're not. Um, I wanted to start with um, Catherine McGuire. You lead our APA advocacy office, and this is a large team that's focusing every day, all day on science advocacy. But what do we mean when we're talking about science advocacy? Could you start us off by defining that term and those activities, please? Thank you, Mitch. Absolutely. This is one of my favorite topics. Um, let, let me start out by just talking about what we call impactful science advocacy. That is science advocacy that requires a multi-pronged approach where we are using a variety of different strategies and tactics at once to advance the value of research to society, as well as applying those findings to everyday challenges. All of us in the advocacy office lead with the science, and that's a value that comes from the top. The advocacy office, let me talk about them a minute. Um, we have four senior advocates and they are our team of those four senior advocates are led by Pat Kobar, who is the deputy chief for scientific affairs. They are dedicated leaders on our team of 22 people who are working to ensure that all 22 on our, of our policy experts in the advocacy office at any given time can advocate for science because it underscores everything psychologists do and value. And our close partnership with experts in the science directorate under your leadership, Mitch, uh, has allowed us to gain a seat at the table on major policy discussions in government. Um, we not only actively support and lobby for increases in federal research funding, but we also importantly ensure that the research done is applied to policy solutions and scientists in our field contribute to the development of policy. So just let me give you a few examples to clarify what I mean by multi-pronged science advocacy. First of all, we, we absolutely are, are your hired guns or your lobbyists um, in Congress. And we, we join in coalitions um, to lobby and we do it on our own. We focus quite a bit of our lobbying in the science arena to increase the budgets for agencies that fund psychological science, primarily NIH, the Institute's National Science Foundation, um, Institute of Education Sciences, and the Department of Defense. And I'll let you know that we work year round to raise the top line numbers. Um, and also at the same time are focusing on getting very special targeted funding for behavioral and social science initiatives. We respond to those same agency strategic, uh, the same agency strategic plans with input from our expert members. A recent example is the plan for the NIH Center for Scientific Review and the NIH Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research, for which we're looking for input now. And we respond to requests for information from agencies that support research. We get a lot of questions about why is that important? Well, this is very important because agencies often gather input from stakeholders before issuing funding announcements. So what we're doing is we're taking advantage of every opportunity we can to provide input from psychological science to those federal agencies. So the information we recently sent about digital devices or health um, or climate change and health or even artificial intelligence, those that psychological science may indeed shape future funding announcements. And one metric we're very proud of and I'll hold Pat Kober and her team, raise them up and congratulate them is that between 2021 and 2022, the science staff has submitted comments on, 2020, on 22 regulatory comments with the help of experts who help shape the responses. And we also, as part of that multi-prong approach, we're looking for every opportunity to put psychologists at the table where important policies are being made by nominating slates of our expert members to key advisory councils to ensure psychology or behavioral science is in the room where it happens. We also look for opportunities for behavioral scientists to communicate to members of Congress about their research and its significance to society, as well as train them to be more assured advocates for psychology. So Mitch, that's a little bit about how we approach um, and how we define Im impactful science advocacy. Turning it back that's to you. That's more than a little bit. It's an amazing amount of work that the science advocacy team does. Thank you so much for summarizing that and, and making that 
so clear. I'm amazed at how much they do in a day. But let me follow up on that. I know we have a lot of scientists here that are interested in being a part of these initiatives and really helping. But one of the things that comes up a lot, Catherine, is folks saying, well, wait a minute, I work at a nonprofit university or I'm part of a healthcare agency. I'm not allowed to be involved in anything related to advocacy. But that's not exactly true. Can you help clarify what can science, how can science, excuse me, scientists be involved? Absolutely. That's a, that is a great question and, and one that we confront quite, quite a bit, quite routinely. Um, I, I, would, I would counsel that the most direct way to find out if your employer has any type of limits on you going to Congress is to just check with the legislative or policy people at your university or, or nonprofit agency, where, wherever you are. Um, we always say, just, just be straight up front with them and say, here's what you're hoping to talk to members of Congress about. For example, why NSF funding is important or why animal research is important. And most, most times you're going to get a reaction that they're very delighted that you're gonna actually uh, you know, take that upon yourself uh, because it's hard work. And you'll hear a little bit more from the advocates here who, who've stepped into that breach um, and helped in that regard. Um, I think the other thing that that is a question that will come back to you, you should be prepared um, to answer is that they, or, or just be prepared for is that they may want you to stress that you are representing APA or yourself, but not the university. And that's fine. That is absolutely fine. Remember too that limitations on lobbying don't include a lot of the conversations you'd be having anyway. I mean, lobbying means that you are advocating for or against specific legislation. And many conversations with congressional offices deal mostly when we have you along with us as the experts, but deal mostly with educating on the various topics or informing the various policies that are being made. So it, it's not, it doesn't meet the definition of lobbying. So talking about what you do, talking about what's going on in your lab, talking about what you know as a scientist kosher, talking about a specific piece of bill may or may not be depending on on the situation. That's really helpful. Thank you. Bill, turning to you, you know, you've done such amazing advocacy work. And one of the things that's tricky in today's society is that things are so divisive. So, you know, I know a lot of scientists think, what if I'm meeting with somebody who might ideologically be on the other side of the political spectrum or disagree with me on a topic that I care so deeply about? Like, how does that go down? What have your experiences been there? Yeah, uh, so uh, that is absolutely true, right? You, uh, I live in Kentucky and tend to differ politically from my political representatives. Um, but, but what I think is most important to get across when you're visiting them is that you're a constituent and that you are representing concerns as a constituent. So to Catherine's point earlier, yeah, you need to check with your institution, just as an example at UK, I have to tell them when I'm going as an advocate, I have to tell them what I'm talking about. Um, but I always make it very clear, I'm here representing myself as a constituent, I'm here representing APA or, or whatever organization I'm there to advocate for. And then it's about talking about the issue that you're there to talk about as a constituent. So just as an example, you, you, what, uh, I, I do addiction research and I tend to talk to my uh, uh, um, uh, uh, elected federal officials, really their staff, you tend to not talk to them directly uh, about an issue that affects me as a constituent. So I'm there talking about addiction, which we know in Kentucky is a major, major issue. So I'm talking about addiction treatment or addiction research and I relate it then back to the district or the state. And that tends to be very, very helpful in getting the point across and setting common ground rather than coming in and saying, I disagree with you about points X, Y, and Z. Say instead, I'm seeking common ground and talking about something that affects us um, where you're, you know, the people who voted for you and the people who you represent live. And that goes a long, long way in finding common ground. That's terrific. Uh, you know, sticking with you for a second, Bill, you know, I know that you have been doing work on the Advocacy Coordinating Committee. Can you explain a little bit, what is that committee? What do they do? Oh, goodness, sure. So the Advocacy Committee Coordinating Committee was formed uh, probably about four or five years ago uh, as a part of a restructuring of how APA and APA Services Inc. operated. Um, and it is a, a group of, I believe, at least 12 individuals 
closer to 15. Um, and it's all uh, it's it's all psychologists, it's all APA and APASI members, and it's broadly diverse. It represents people who are interested in science and practice, public interest, education. And we help to recommend to the board of directors each year the advocacy priorities for 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 APA and APASI. Um, and we do some other things, but that's sort of our biggest work product every year. So those 18 priorities that you see as APA members, APA uh, Advocacy Coordinating Committee develops that draft and recommends it to the board for then further action. And that helps Catherine's office then really focus on what those specific uh, uh, priorities are. Terrific. Thank you. Reggie, I wanted to ask you, um, we know that advocacy is especially important for scientists who are working with non-human animal models. Can you tell us what you think is at stake for scientists to do this sort of advocacy for basic research? Yeah, well, um, animal models, I think, obviously have their own set of unique problems, but basic research in general sort of suffers from this too. And honestly, all of our research probably suffers from this, which is that most of our representatives really don't know what we do, um, right? They don't know what we do. They don't know how we do it. They don't know why we do it. And the information that they do have about what we do tends to be um, misinformation. So it's either things they're picking up from the media or things they're getting from other groups that are also coming to speak to them. So for those of us who work with animals in, in psychology, there are many groups out there who lobby and advocate against our work existing. So um, things like PETA and White Coat Waste, um, they are meeting with their representatives regularly. And so for us, if we're not also there to explain the science behind what we do and explain the value and connect it, as Bill pointed out, to the, you know, the constituents and to the, the issues that our Congress people care about, then they don't know that this is something that's important, right? They only have the information that they've been given. So I think um, us being there and speaking up and providing them with information, providing them with resources and connections to us in case they want to reach out at any point with questions um, is just really important to get the, the information that we need out there, out there. And Reggie, you know, a lot of the grant funding seems to end up flowing to more of the applied science areas. And, you know, we want to see more for the basic science areas itself. What's, what are your thoughts or your guidance about how to make sure that we're getting the relevant attention, the necessary attention towards more funding for basic science? Yeah, well, you know, basic science is the basis of all science, right? So um, just explaining the importance of it can be can be difficult, but is really important. And I, so I think advocating for basic science as the basis for other science is a good place to start. Um, We've found it to be particularly effective to provide examples of the path between basic science and more applied or translational work. Um, so, you know, we, we um, with animal research specifically, finding cases that tend to be of interest to people generally, things like um, treating PTSD in veterans or the opioid um, crisis. These are not things where we can do a lot of research in humans, right? At least a lot of the, the basic research needs to be done in animal models for ethical reasons. And so we can lay out the value of that type of work for the translational things that, that people really care about. Um, we can also give great examples of starting with really, really basic research and things that go on. So one of my favorites is, is oxytocin. So like oxytocin, you hear about everywhere now, right? It's like the miracle drug that everyone wants to use to try to figure out how to solve all sorts of problems. And there's research going on into its uses in schizophrenia and depression and addiction and autism, right? All sorts of things. But the reason that we know oxytocin has some value in treating social um, disorders is because of some neuroscience work done in voles. And the reason that we knew to even look in voles at oxytocin was because of some really, really basic biology work looking at mating habits of different vole species, right? And so we started at this really, truly basic level and we've come up now to the translation. So I think giving those kinds of examples can be helpful. That's terrific, thank you. Erin is a doctoral student. You don't have a lot of free time, I'm guessing, but you have taken your time to do work in advocacy. Why did you, why did you get started in that? What inspired you? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And people say that a lot. And I always like to bounce it back that, you know, faculty also are not rolling in free time. So I think everyone on this call can relate to that feeling. Um, you know, for me, as was mentioned in my introduction, my clinical and my research work really focuses on brain tumor. Um, for any of you who have ever worked um, in oncology and, and in particular in pediatric oncology, which is where I focus, um, you really see that there's, you know, this moment where every single thing in a person's life changes and overnight they're expected to become, you know, experts in clinical trial enrollment and drug side effects and educational accommodations and, you know, patient advocacy. Um, and so working with that population, there really was a moment for me where I was like, okay, like if, if you all can bring this energy and this, you know, advocacy to what you're dealing with right now with your child or your family, then I will meet you there, right? Like I can bring exactly that much advocacy to now addressing the systems level issues that are often, you know, really at the core of some of the, the challenges that, that patients face and that researchers face and not having adequate funding and support to um, continue to, to work towards a cure for cancer. So that was really kind of my starting point um, for why I wanted to get involved, but it's very fitting that this is an APA science event because it was through APA science that I actually was able to get involved um, through my work with the APA science student council and, and the uh, advocacy offices um, work um, throughout the, you know, from the start of the pandemic to now and creating these virtual hill events um, where, you know, even with kind of limited time, limited financial resources, you know, I'm not jetting off to DC every weekend, but I'm still able to meet very regular with the, the offices of my, my federal representatives to talk about these issues continuously. Oh, that's awesome. Erin, you are an expert on how we should be training students um, for all the work that you've done in APAGS and the Science Student Council and your experience in a training program. Um, what should we be training young people uh, starting their careers about advocacy, or if anything? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I'm actually doing some data collection on this uh, very question right now. So stay tuned for the results and kind of recommendations from that research project. Um, but, you know, really what I think it comes down to is, again, you know, as you mentioned, like there are very real constraints in terms of time. Um, training programs are already really long. Um, not everybody has the interest in every type of advocacy, right? Um, Catherine was talking before about that multi-pronged approach. Not everyone wants to meet with their federal lawmakers and engage in lobbying or policy advocacy. And so I think that the focus should shift away from, you know, what can programs, like what specific experiences should programs provide, but rather really focus on programs need to help foster an identity as advocates and psychologists so that when we do graduate, we go out into the world saying, as a psychologist, I have an understanding of the many intersecting systems that impact my patients and my research, right? I understand what's happening at a local and a national and an international level. And I view myself as an effective agent of change in those systems, right? Like I know that as a scientist, as a psychologist, I can actually make a difference in those systems and I'm willing to take the steps to do that. And I think that um, psychologists, like, again, every single person on this call, we already have so many of those skills and that knowledge base to do this work. I think the missing piece is really that, like, identity as an advocate. Um, and so I think, you know, at the end of the day, regardless of the resources and the time that programs have, what they should be doing is helping trainees develop that sense of advocacy, something that's important, and it's something that I can successfully do. Well said. Thank you. I wanted to open it up to the whole panel and ask you, so, you know, I, I think that many scientists might relate to the, the moment in time when you receive your letter from the editor that your manuscript has been accepted, hooray. And you look at those findings that you spent years to get and you think, now if only these stakeholders knew about this, or if only the president knew about this, or if only all of Congress knew about this, um, so I think we have a couple of choices. One is we could wait for the senators to find our article in the journal and read it on their own. I'm guessing that that's not the most effective approach. Um, what would you advise we do instead? You're in the possession of an important finding or body of findings. You think everyone can really benefit. What do you do next? Who do you contact? So I think there's a couple options. Um, I'll, I'll dive in. So I mean, you know, uh, if you're working within an institution, you're working within a university or you're working at a nonprofit, you know, that that group will have some PR arm, right? So I think I think that's one 
One way is, especially if it's really, you know, impactful and it showcases the institution, that's one thing. If you're, uh, I also a big fan of self-promotion, tasteful self-promotion. Um, so, you know, putting things out on Twitter because the, yeah, I, 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 Twitter has a lot of problems, but I find for science sort of knowledge, it's really, really good. People putting uh, preprints and new publications out. But if you're talking about sort of important advocacy work that you need to, to get in the hands of the government, a couple other options. Um, of course, you know, as you build confidence as an advocate and you build relationships with your federal offices, you can absolutely share that information with people. Like just as an example, I Mitch McConnell is, my, is one of my senators and I have a really, really great relationship with some of his staffers. And so if there's something I need them to know, I'm not shy anymore. And I email them and say, hey, here's this finding or hey, we discussed this, here's an option. But also talking with sort of your federal funders as well. You know, I, I tend to be funded by NIDA, the National Center on Drug Abuse or NIAAA. Um, and when I have something that is important that NIDA funded, I let them know about it because they may want to publicize it as well. So, that, so those are, you know, it, it, maybe we're bashful and maybe we don't want to, you know, appear self-congratulatory, but there's a way to get our work out there in a way that, that is effective, but, but maybe isn't, you know, isn't, isn't trying to hog the spotlight or, or any of those kind of things. And, and, and you've done, you've worked really, really hard and the taxpayer has paid for this work. So share it, be, be thoughtful about it and, and, and share it um, uh, broadly. Terrific. Other ideas? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just, um, I'll just add to um, what Bill has said, um, and just uh, share a little. Maybe it's a little rule that we always, that we always cite with ourselves, and that is, right time, right place, right messenger. So when that research is coming out, it always serves any of us. I we say any of us really it serves us well to pause and really take stock. Well, is this the right time to really do what Bill had said, which is to communicate it? Are there other things that are going on in society or other things where you can't get through the noise, right? To so that society can see this, this, uh, this new finding or you know whatever or discovery. Um, the right messenger is 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 really critical as well, because sometimes you might be the right messenger, but other times it can be it could be like Aaron for you. I mean, it could be. Uh, a professor, it could be someone who's very senior in the university, it could actually even be like a third party who's outside of the university that you're working with. Um, and going back to that right time, right place, um, the right place is, do you know the channel, like Bill mentioned Twitter, that's a great channel to get things out there, but it doesn't have the legs, it does not have the staying power, it's a great place to announce things, but know the right place where you've got staying power, where you can anchor your science so that the most people can see it. And what if it is the right time? What if everyone's talking about abortion and you study abortion and you're screaming at your TV screen, you're wrong, I have the science right here. You know, what? what's the best, uh, the best way to kind of make that approach? Or who in your office might be good to contact? Like, um, what, what's, like, what's the best way to start getting involved? What's the way to get involved? Um, so uh, I, I am all about power to the people. Um, we are in a, uh, a period of time in our country where the power has shifted away from the fe federal government to the states. So the constituent voice is the strongest voice right now in your in your states with your with your lawmakers from your state. And so that um, to your to your point about someone saying, I have this piece of legislation. I mean, share it with Mitch, share it with me. We will figure out together, if if you need us, we will figure out and we can we can kind of walk through that together, how to best get that to the lawmakers, but the other decision makers, because sometimes you're in a district where they're not the decision makers. Bill Bill's with a decision maker. He's he's with one of the deciders. Um, so he might be a better person to carry something, you know, from from a different state, from Alaska or something. Um but ab absolutely, we're, we're here to engage and always, I always say, always, always look in your own backyard first about how you can use that research in your community even to educate people. That's great. And to your point, Catherine, um, as far as contacting the science office, more than welcome to. 
please tell your division presidents, even if you're not a member of APA, go tell your division president. We have a channel with them. We are sending things out at least once a week saying that we need the science on X topic or Y topic. We're constantly doing that. And we need your division president to say, I have just the person for you. You know, so that's how we work. Um, the closer you are connected, the more you can make sure that your research is top of radar. And um, and yeah, what we see there, Catherine sees that right away. Pat sees that right away. And that's going to be really powerful. So, Mitch, can I also just add on to that, that we sure. in June launched, it's called the Division Advocacy Partner Program. And at this point in time, we're at 12 divisions, 12 divisions who have named advocacy partners. And uh, it, it has just been amazing and rewarding to just see that bi-directional communication, those, those, the, the doors have been opened, so to speak, doors and windows. I mean, we're getting all kinds of good information that we, we have missed and information as in research that is really enriching our work here for you. Terrific. Um, so some people might feel a little bit um, daunted by the idea of contacting a policymaker directly. You know, what do you say? How do you get practice? And I know that um, there's been some training and opportunities to really do that through APA or other kinds of summits. I, I don't know, Erin, um, have you had the chance to be at an advocacy day? For do you Can you take a moment to talk a little bit about what that's like and whether that helped you to feel kind of ready to go and talk with a congressional member or staffer? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so definitely, I, you know, I've seen a couple of Q&A come in that are student focused of like, well, how do students start getting involved? So I'll also drop this in the chat and make sure that it ends up um, on the, um, you know, like the recording web hosted area of, of resources. Um, but some other uh, alum of the Science Student Council and I have actually put together, um, it's called Airtable. I don't know if any of you used it before. It's kind of like a fancy Google Sheet, um, but of different advocacy opportunities to address kind of the specific issue of people saying like, well, I know that I want to do this, but I have no idea how to do it. Um, so what I will say is that getting involved with any professional organization, whether that is um, APA or something like the National Brain Tumor Society, the Alzheimer's Association, Research America, AAAS, you know, all of those organizations have folks just like Catherine and Pat who are full-time expert paid staff to help support those advocacy efforts. So your job coming in as a psychological scientist is not to be an expert on how government works or an expert on every bill that's before Congress, because that's their job, right? Your job is to say, I'm a constituent and I am an expert on this specific topic or, you know, these, this is my community. These are people I see in my practice every day, you know, whatever it is, and to really just share your story. Um, again, speaking to any, you know, students who are on this call or early career folks who maybe feel like, well, I don't know if this time is right for me. Again, I, you know, definitely can relate to that feeling, but just also want to put it out there again, right? This reminder that if you are writing a dissertation on something, you already know more about that topic than like 99% of people in the world, right? I think in the context of academia, maybe you don't view yourself as an expert, but meeting with lawmakers, um, the majority of whom their background is in law or business, to them, like you are an expert on science, you are an expert on healthcare, um, just, you know, by your daily activities. And so I think um, those trainings that, that Mitch mentioned, you know, really are a great opportunity to learn how to be more comfortable with that process while really being coached through it again by people um, like Catherine, like Pat, like the other advocacy staff, um, whose, you know, job it is to help you feel comfortable so that you can just, you know, do what you do best, which is sharing your science and sharing your experiences. Terrific. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to underscore the experience of talking with folks and the level of scientific knowledge or expertise, it's much lower than you might expect because of course they're just, they their expertise in a different discipline. So really, I mean, every everyone who's been admitted to a doctoral program has something incredibly valuable and very knowledgeable and useful to say, um, and shouldn't feel like people are gonna say like, oh, I know that I totally read those papers already. No, that's not gonna happen, so um, great. Um, so an interesting question has come in from um, our uh, listeners. What national advocacy strategies do you suggest for folks who are residents of Washington, D.C. and do not have elected representation in Congress? Any thoughts? Uh, 
Well, if we haven't connected with you in DC yet, then we need you. Um, uh, I, I would say that the, the thought here is that because you are local, um, we have a lot of opportunities that come before us with uh, like three hours notice. Um, government is getting back to in-person and we can always use someone who is very being willing um, to kind of step forward and, and join us um, in, in our advocacy efforts in the DC area. Um, that said, um, I would tell you that, 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 I mean, DC does have at large, as they say, you know, uh, representation and, and, and the DC psychologists are some of the most active psychologists um, in, that, that we work with. Um, what, we, what we try to do is we, we call it the DMV, we will group them with Maryland or we we'll group them with uh, Virginia sometimes, or we just group them as the DC, you know, DC psychologists and, and scientists. Um, but there is a big footprint there. And, um, and, and I would just say we, we, we rely on you. Um, and we could, we could help show you the way on how to, how to contribute. Terrific. Question for everybody. Um, we're two weeks away from national elections, of course. Um, now, APA is officially nonpartisan, and the APA staff are not allowed to use APA resources for any sort of electioneering. But most members of Congress are now away from Washington, so they're back in their, their districts um, campaigning closer to home. You might be able to go to a town hall or to some sort of event and ask a question um, or meet with somebody, um, including their staffers, to talk about psychology. What are the kinds of things that you would want to say or think we could all be saying um, to support science, to support psychological science or the areas of science that you are in? Any thoughts of what you might say? Talk Seems like everybody's shy. Go, go ahead, Erin. <laughs> um, I was just going to say, um, you know, as I, I think it was Bill, maybe you had mentioned before, most often you're going to be meeting with staff in the offices. Um, and there are kind of two main categories of staff that I've met with historically. So there's either the DC based staff um, or the local district staff. Um, and when you're meeting with district staff, so these are people who actually live, you know, within your congressional district. So they're local to you. Um, these are folks who are often honestly very excited to have a, you know, work field trip. Um, I've had multiple district staff say like, you know, can I come take a, you know, tour of your lab like if you ever have a presentation happening I'd love to come see it and so I think just making those like human connections letting people know hey I'm somebody who's here like physically in the state and I'm interested and I want to be a resource for you is one of the most valuable things that you can do because it means that you know regardless of what you know the the lawmakers priorities are right now or kind of their stance on particular issues it means that if a bill does come across their table you know where it's you know about um you know, animal research regulations, or it's about addiction, right, then they'll be like, wait, like, I, I met someone at this town hall who actually knows a lot about this, like, let me, you know, dig up their contact information. So I think just showing up in and of itself um, is, you know, really, really valuable and important. Yeah, I, and I, I would, I completely agree. I think, I, and I think Aaron had made a point about, you know, tell a story. So, so science is important, and you've got to have some data, and you've got to have some facts, but a story is better. A story with data is the best, right? Um, and I think you know the, the 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 point about inviting someone to your lab is 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 a really really good one. Make sure your university knows about it because you don't want them to find out that somebody representing your senator or your congressperson showed up at your lab and they didn't know about it. So so just just do that paperwork first. But but totally worth doing. Um, and you know I, I think if you're going to show up at a, at a town hall to you know talk about issues that are important to you. Um, you know, I, 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 I would sort of just my example, I would show up and I, I, I tend to talk a lot about NIH and NIH funding. And so I, you know, I and, and I live in a university town, so it's easy for make that for me to make that point important. So Congressman Barr is my congressman and say, you know, can you talk about your support for NIH um, and, and this type of research and, and relate it back to I'm in a university town. It funds a lot of this university. And I think it's important for you to speak to that. Right. And um, so it's all about, like like Aaron said, the relationship is about the story and it's about bringing it back to where you live and where that person lives. And I, I would I would just add to what Aaron and, and Bill have brought up because they make fantastic points and and say that um, 
I, I have always approached um, engagement at chicken barbecues or, you know, more or parades as um, as everyday advocacy opportunities. I mean, I'm always wearing I'm always wearing the hat, the advocate hat. And so if I have any type of political interaction or someone approaches me to um, to pitch themselves, I, I mean, my time isn't free. I'm not just going to like fold, you know, fold up and say, absolutely, we love you. I'm going to say, well, well, wait a minute. Let me just like Bill is saying, you know, let, with, with uh, Congressman Barr, well, let, let me just ask you a few questions. We've worked with your office in the past. You know, that's another that's a good lead in. Or I saw you were recently on the front page of the of the of the newspaper talking about a new behavioral supporting a new behavioral uh, science lab some funding can you can you tell me more about that you know and connect yourself with that ask with that person but my my advice would be just in those one on one interactions you have never walk away without extracting extracting some support for psychological science from the individual yeah i mean everybody sort of said said all these things already but um uh, it is a great time to to go meet with your local folks and to remind them that they have scientists in their district, right? So, um, you know, it takes a while to get comfortable being like, hi, it's nice to meet you. I'm a scientist. But it is kind of important to identify yourself that way um, because a lot of Congress people really don't interact with scientists that often. And so, you know, I mean, Bill pointed this out, but like connecting it back to the, the local area and, you know, is this grant money coming in and, and paying a lot of people's salaries, right? Like it has to do with employment. Um, and these are issues that they care a lot about. So just reminding them that you're there um, and thanking them for work that they've done that has been important to science. So for supporting scientific funding or supporting bills that were relevant to psychological science um, can also be just a good way to sort of get in there, let them know who you are and, and start making those connections. Speaking of scientific funding, you know, this has a direct impact on the day-to-day -day job of most academics and scientists, much less whether they get promoted, tenured, you know, we would ideally like to see, you know, them funding up to the 99th percentile because they have so much money, they're going to fund every great proposal. Um, I guess let's start with, you know, what is, what is APA doing to increase the amount of money that federal agencies have for psychological science. What's an example of a typical week or month, perhaps, of the kinds of ways that AP is fighting for that? Well, I would, I'd, I'd like to jump in and answer this, but I really would like to bring Pat Kobor on camera, if you would, Pat. Pat, Pat is the Deputy uh, Chief of Advocacy for Scientific Affairs, and I, I really don't want to, uh, I. I don't want to steal your thunder here because I you you work so hard day in and day out. Well, thanks and hi everyone. Um, one example is um, um, we worked with a couple of behavioral and social science organizations to get additional funding for the NIH Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research. Um, one of the things that OBSSR does is co-fund grants. OBSSR doesn't fund grants itself, but it will fund a, a grant proposal from NIMH that's right on the line or the, from the Arthritis Institute. Or, so everything it funds is, uh, is behavioral and social science. And we, um, with my uh, colleague Angela Sharp, were very fortunate um, to, to get additional funding. We had asked... Um, We'd ask Congress for 20 million additional for the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research, and we got 10. So 10's okay. I mean, it's not 20, but we're very happy with it. And that's you know that's cold hard cash, and you know in somebody's pocket, and and more good research that's being funded. Um, and 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 this was just good old fashioned shoe leather advocacy, right? Um, we um, targeted a, a member of Congress on the Appropriations Committee. We brought constituents from that state to talk to her and say why they thought it, it was important. We talked to the chair of the committee. Um, lots of little steps along the way before that was approved. And, and, you know, a year goes by and, you know, they still haven't passed the bill. And then they pass the bill and it's in the, that money's in the um, press release. So we're like, this is great. <laughs> but that's an example of, of one, you know, 
of going for something specific to behavioral and social sciences research. And I know, Pat, the friends of NIMH and NIDA, you know, they're, APA is a very unique and, and potentially powerful relationship in really supporting and, and cultivating uh, uh, allegiance to behavioral science. Anything you could say about that? Those coalitions are, are, are very important, I think. Um, we, we want to have good relationships with the people in federal agencies. And this is a really nice way to, to cultivate those relationships. Um, it makes us better advocates. I know more about NIMH now because I'm participating in that coalition and I'm listening to the staff speak to our to our members about you know various programs and the work of the of the different branches. Um, and it's a nice way to work with um, with other organizations that have the same interest. Um, there are lots of organizations interested in mental health research, and it's not necessarily the ones that you that, that, that you think of first. Um, um, with the Friends of NICHD, Catherine's been on that uh, executive committee. We work with the pediatricians and the um, and lots of other um, organizations, the obstetricians and gynecologists, in support of of overall funding for that institute. And um, and that you know that rising tide lifts our boats too. Great, thank you. What are some other ways that um, scientists themselves can be helpful in the work that's being done to get more funding for psychological science? So I'll I'll, I'll jump in. I'd like to hear Pat as well. Um, what well what because of our interactions with the agencies on a daily basis, one of the things that we're often pressed for is the five to 10 years from now, which is, is the issue spotting. What are those issues that are coming up that the Institute should start stink, you know, thinking about? Um, the federal funding streams that come through Congress and are appropriated, um, you know, they, they are funding kind of those here and now and, and maybe three, maybe, maybe five years. I would never think it's five years. It's, um, appropriations are an annual, uh, on an annual cycle. But if there was something really valuable, it would be looking, looking across society, looking across, you know, in the work that you're doing and, and I would say getting ahead, getting, getting out in front, you know, where, where do we want the, the Institute's NSF? Where do we want them looking? Where are we predicting they should be looking and, um, and, and investing research dollars. That makes good sense. You're reminding me of the kinds of advocacy that sometimes doesn't involve a funding agency or the legislative branch at all, the ways in which science is being used, let's say in a Surgeon General report or something like that to raise global awareness. Um, does anyone wanna talk a little bit about ways that you see that as being important or powerful? I see a lot of folks nodding their heads. Catherine, you want to take a first stab sure. at that? Thanks. Sure. I um, I have uh, proudly uh, been a part of APA's efforts on both the Surgeon General's um, guidance on protecting youth mental health, as well as last week's announced um, effort on uh, workplace mental health and well-being. And what I want to reiterate about that is that these 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 are these are these are policy guidances and efforts that did not happen overnight. We started building those relationships. When I say we, it's us along with our expert psychologists. We had them in the room, we had them at the table. This is going back years. We were there, we did not, as I said, we never went AWOL. We, we remained at the table bringing fresh science, fresh points of view. Um, and all of that then culminated with having built the trust as a reliable scientific organization, that the Surgeon General's office amongst HHS veterans, all these various organizations could rely upon. Um, so Mitch, um, I um, I'm not sure if that kind of gets to your gets to your question, but um, I, I, I think at the that I mean those are those are some applied examples. yet I could I could talk about long COVID. I mean we had we were we were um, working with the White House task force on on COVID. And health equity, and we had our our neuroscience experts. We had them in giving testimony, educating the White House 
on what long COVID was before really it kind of had hit the newspapers as long COVID's here and it's not going away. So those are those are some of those examples of kind of relationship building over time. And um, maybe it's kind of an early bird. Like we're trying to, we're trying to predict and get there ahead of others um, to do the job. Well, I just have to say as a, as a scientist myself to see, you know, science that APA has put in front of folks to be cited in the State of the Union address, mm -hmm. to see it in these Surgeon General reports, to hear that White House task forces have consulted with psychologists. And as I now see, because you all have, you know, everyone on this call has put that right in front of folks and used it. It's just so incredibly exciting and gratifying to be like, wow, all this science really can make a difference thanks to to the to you all on this call who do so much work to really get it there and to really help connect the dots and show people how many answers we have. So it's just great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd be remiss without answering, uh, giving you all a chance to answer a couple of questions that have come up in the chat also that are fantastic. Um, one of them uh, frustratingly says that um, this person in their institution like others, are being attacked for evidence-based gender-affirming care. How can APA be a resource in cases where it's beyond a disagreement and it's evolved now to a more threatening situation? Any thoughts about that? I think there was just recently a, a, a document that went out from APA on gender-affirming care, on affirming care for gender non-binary. Match, Mitch, can you can you repeat that? I'm sorry, you you kind of oh, sure. my my end. Sure, yeah. yeah. Some some folks are being attacked for providing evidence based gender affirming care, mm -hmm. and how can APA you know use our science to be a resource to really demonstrate the the importance of using gender affirming care and moving this from a political debate uh, to back to people being able to engage in safe practice. Yeah. So one one of our our new uh, advocacy tools is is working with the science directorate in developing as we call them resource pages but it, it is a bad what they do on whatever the topic is gender affirming care hate and violence um social media and adolescence they are they are um very carefully um pulling together the the freshest and most salient and impactful science into one pagers um most recently to the to the point about uh, gender affirming care, um, in the in the state of um, Oklahoma, I'll use Oklahoma as an example. There was legislation that was going to ban OU Health from receiving any type of state funds if they proceeded to engage in any gender affirming care. Um, Mitch Mitch engaged in a coalition effort um, with the Trevor Project, and and from a communications angle, they were able to post a an op-ed into the Oklahoma the day that it was being, um, it was being deliberated. Um, the Oklahoma State um, OPA um, uh, Psych, Psych Association had their hands full. And this gets to the, 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 the kind of this threatening part of uh, the equation. Um, Oklahoma, un, uh, uh, like many states, are, are, are in a situation of trying to uh, seek a balance. And leading with science is what we have been saying is that balance. It, um, and when I say it's the balance, it's, the, it's um, not being perceived as leaders, as picking, you know, subjectively picking one side or the other. So those resource um, sheets, those resources that we've been sharing with the states, instead of like in the Oklahoma um, situation, instead of them saying, we don't have a position because they didn't want to alienate their members on the left or their members on the other side or the right. Um, they said, here's what the psychological science says. And that's what they distributed. And so we're, we're finding that that's where the trust has been built in, in Congress and with other lawmakers is what we're, if we're always leading with that bedrock or that the underpinnings of what we do are psychological science, we, we're able to get in the offices either side and, and start building the trust uh, with those offices. And I, so that would be my recommendation is rely on the science. That's great, thank you. Reggie, Aaron, and Bill, um, you all have contacts with undergraduate students 
And we have so many questions about how do you get undergrads involved in advocacy work? Um, so yeah, so I teach at a primarily undergraduate institution. So we have lots of undergrad students. Um, and if you are an undergraduate or you're somebody who's mentoring undergraduates, um, you know, the answer is the same way you get anybody involved in, in advocacy work. So usually with our undergraduates, a lot of the advocacy advocacy work starts more with communication. So communicating about science to non-scientists, whether that's their Congress people, which sometimes is the case, or whether it's just at the local children's museum talking to um, you know, young children or, or families about the science that, they, that they're interested in sharing. But the techniques that you use for communicating science to non-scientists are pretty universal, right? So your audience shifts, but practicing how do you pick a message and stay on message? How do you make your science understandable and appealing to people who don't have the background or the interest that you have? Um, those are all skills that are really valuable in, in advocacy work. Um, and also just educating the, pus the public is of course advocacy work on its own, right? Um, because the more people we have who understand and support our science, the more advocates we have. So for our undergraduates, that's one of the major ways we've gotten them involved. And I, mean, I, also, I think, oh, oh, go sorry, ahead, Aaron, go, Aaron, you go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think kind of like modeling and supporting students advocacy within your own institution is also really valuable. Um, I think sometimes students can walk away with this feeling of, well, if I can't even get, you know, my own department chair or my own university president to listen to me, what chance do I have of getting, you know, a, a congressperson to listen to me? And so I think supporting students through channels of, okay, you see issues, you know, on this very campus, how, you know, what is the process of engaging in, in conversation, you know, with university administration about policy? and things like that can also be a really effective tactic. And the only other thing I would say is, you know, it's maybe start small, right? You know, it's daunting to be thinking I'm going to be going to the Hill or I'm going to be meeting on Zoom with, you know, I've got to have this spiel, which APA prepares you really, really well for, by the way. So, um, uh, but, you know, we get those action alerts. I think it's what voter voice and, you know, sending an email, you know, especially if the text is crafted for you, it's really, really a nice way to start, whether you're an undergrad or not. So, so I mean, that's also something that I always say is, you know, APA can link you in and can let you know when there's something you're interested in that, you know, they need you to respond for, be a constituent for. And that's just a really, really easy way to, to, to begin. And I, I would add just one, one point, and that is uh, a couple of years ago, I started working with Ro Rosie Phillips Davis, um, who's at the University of Memphis on curriculum, advocacy curriculum that she could use with her doctoral students. And, and um, she's now run the class uh, two times. Um, and what we, what we started thinking about in this, Erin, this goes to your, some of the reflections that you just shared is, is number one, how to demystify and how to build confidence in the, in the, in the doctoral or, or students. And, and what this training is that we, I mean, curriculum, we'd happy to share it, um, is that it, it really um, is based on getting active in your own community, right? How do you build coalitions? How do you bring science, the psychological science to, to places that are in your own community? I mean, you could go and work, you know, with a housing, um, a section eight housing administration. You could do, I mean, there's all kinds of things that you could, you could bring psychological science to. So I think that's just something that's intentional that um, we're, we're thinking that might be, that might be something others um, might, might find attractive is, is just intentionally having a curriculum for, for the doctoral level students. That's great. Well, uh, just a very quick announcement as we say goodbye. Thank you so much for participating. We hope you enjoyed this. You're gonna get a one minute survey after this broadcast. It'd be great to get feedback so we can make more conversations that are useful for you. You can find a copy of this recording and any relevant materials on our Essential Science Conversations page, as well as links to our previous Essential Science Conversations. Also, any, any feedback or suggestions you have, you can email us at science at apa.org. If you wanna hear about seminars like this, free stats trainings, money and awards that we're giving away to top scientists to promote psychological science, you should be subscribing to APA Science Spotlight. And if you're interested in getting uh, the top science articles from APA journals picked by the editors themselves, then you should be subscribing to the Editor's Choice newsletter, all for free 
not just for APA members, and those links are in the chat. I'd like to thank Pat, Bill, Aaron, Catherine, and Reggie so much for participating today. And thanks as always to Chandler Hoover and everyone who helped behind the scenes to make this happen. Have a great day, everybody.